All right. I think uh, we've got at least some of the people that have joined us tonight. We might get into it to not give up too much time. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this important conversation about men, sex and violence. As you might have read, Catherine Murphy wrote this week, what women need is for men and the cultures that they dominate to change. We're going to be exploring that reality together tonight. Um, my name is Brad Chilcott. I'm the Executive Director of White Ribbon Australia, and I'm coming to you from what is and always will be Ghana land. I pay my respects to elders past, present and future of these lands and to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us from many different lands. It's essential that we remember that the privilege that we enjoy came at great cost to others, that sovereignty has never been ceded and that injustice continues to this day. And as we're talking about issues of violence and sexual abuse, sexual harassment, we know that First Peoples are disproportionately impacted by these issues. And so we collectively commit to walking with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in a spirit of harmony towards a future where all people have equal opportunity to belong, contribute and thrive in our society. You might have noticed that um, unfortunately, my good friend Jamila has had to attend to some personal issues at short notice this afternoon. So the incredible Zuika, Christine Zuika, I don't know why I said your last name first, Christine, I'm sorry. It was just an attempt to make sure I pronounced it right, has joined, joined us and we're eternally grateful to you. We've also got our other two excellent guests, Professor Michael Salter and Dr. Zach Seidler, and I'll introduce them all more fully soon. But I wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping first. Um, as I said, there's more than 2,000 people registered tonight. Uh, you can see that the chat function is on and um, Alan from White Ribbon Australia will be commenting in there and responding to some of your questions. Afsa and Hannah from Essential are the moderators and they can respond to any of your tech questions if things aren't working. But I do want to say that we will exclude anyone who isn't helping us create a safe space and we won't tolerate any misogyny, racism, homophobia or transphobia at all. It's also a conversation tonight about eliminating men's violence and sexual abuse. While we know that there are other forms of violence that need to be addressed, that's not what we're talking about tonight. So please respect that, otherwise we'll need to remove your ability to contribute to the chat. And if things do get too wild in there, we are going to turn it off. So I really hope we don't need to do that. Many of us here joined the Women's March for Justice a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it was a visible expression of the visceral anger women in Australia feel about the ongoing pandemic of men's sexual abuse and violence and the lack of men being held to account. The courageous leadership of Brittany Higgins and Grace Tame and others has been the catalyst for this public demand for change, but this anger isn't new. 85% of women say they have experienced sexual harassment and one third of all women report experiencing sexual or physical violence from men. And these numbers may be higher in reality. I was one of the men that marched that day in solidarity with the women leading us. I did that because I think it's time that men, all of us men took responsibility. The truth is that we've preferenced men's desires, choices, ambitions, careers, and opinions. We have objectified and harassed we have protected our privilege and power. I've done these things and we should stop pretending that we haven't. Men, on this call, on this webinar today, be real. We've seen, ignored, excused, and even celebrated sexual harassment, disrespect, and inequality. We've protected our privilege. We haven't believed women as we should. Today, we need to choose to change all of it, first in ourselves and then in society. This is gonna be a hard conversation in parts and it may raise traumatic experiences for many of us who are listening tonight. We've pinned a couple of phone numbers or put a couple of phone numbers in the chat for you to call if you need someone to speak to for support. 1-800-RESPECT. Um, if you've experienced sexual violence or any form of violence and need some support, or if you're a man who's worried about your own use of violence, please call Men's Referral Service and have a conversation with someone who can help. 
We're also here, I want to say from the beginning, not only to talk about the issues, but more importantly, to commit to meaningful action. It's not enough for us to know things are bad. We need to reflect on our own role in creating the change that we need in order to build a future where women and children are safe from all forms of men's violence and abuse. That includes me and Michael and Zach. We're not perfect men to look up to. That's not why we're on a webinar. It's not why we're in the positions that we have. We're men who need to look at ourselves as much as the culture and systems we benefit from in terms of our own power and privilege. So let's meet our panelists. Christine Zivica is a freelance writer based in Melbourne. She started her career at Ms. Magazine in New York. She was a 2002 Burns Journalism Fellowship recipient, spending three months in Munich working for a daily paper. More recently, she's managed strategic communications campaigns for the UK's Equality and Human Rights Commission and the Media Engagement Program for Our Watch, the National Foundation to Prevent Violence Against Women. Christine, perhaps uh, you could tell us whose land you're on as you speak to us tonight. Um, and then as much as you would like to share, as much as you feel comfortable, tell us how you're currently feeling about how Australia and our leaders are responding to the revelations of the last few weeks. Yeah, thanks for that, Brad. I'm coming to you from the Wundjeri lands of the Kulin Nation, and I too pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. Um, that's, that's a really good question. And I think I'm a little bit on the sort of Susie Sunshine um, end of things. Uh, not entirely uncharacteristically for me. I try to maintain hope and optimism. Um, but I'd say two words have kind of really defined how I've been feeling this last week, hope and accountability. I often refer to this quote from Rebecca Solnit, uh, which really exemplifies a very active definition of hope, which I um, cling to, which is hope isn't a lottery ticket that you can sit with on the sofa feeling lucky. It's an ax that you use to break down doors in an emergency. And in my mind, um, that's what we're all collectively doing at the moment. It's, an, it's a, that kind of active act of hope. And that's certainly what um, the survivors who've been speaking publicly have been doing. I'm thinking of Grace Kane, um, of course, Brittany Higgins, uh, the women who spoke out in, you know, arguably the kind of first wave Me Too uh, in Australia and the women who've been speaking out on these issues for decades. And I, I think I saw Rosie was um, in this chat. And I certainly want to pay tribute to the work that, that she's done in speaking out and really kind of manifesting that active version of hope as an ax that you use to break down a door in an emergency. It's kind of come to this and that's where we are. Um, and I also was quite struck by, um, in that same piece that you alluded to in The Guardian earlier that week by uh, Catherine Murphy, she said that Brittany Higgins was um, lifted onto the stage by a kind of convection of hope that came from the crowd. And I certainly felt that at the um, march that I attended in, in Melbourne. I, th I think we feel like we have really reached a turning point. And why have we feel like we've reached a turning point? And that gets to the second um, word about accountability. I feel like we're in a new era of accountability. Um, there's relentless, absolutely relentless focus on these issues now, and there's just no getting away from them. Um, and if you just take the, the Australian Human Rights Commission sexual harassment inquiry as an example, um, I, I certainly played a lead in kind of contributing to that. And I, I was very cognizant at the time that the uh, Liberal and coalition governments don't have a fantastic track record of um, responding to these inquiries. They shove them in a drawer, they don't respond to them. They never responded to the 2014 pregnancy discrimination inquiry. We now have relentless calls to action to, to implement those 55 recommendations. Um, we've had a commitment from the Prime Minister that there will be a response before the May budget. And I can give you countless other examples on, on different fronts, on different issues in relation to gender equality and violence against women, where I really feel like there is a new era of accountability and we're at a key critical crossroads to move forward. So I think that does give me hope. That's awesome. Thanks, Christine. Um, there's a few comments there in the in the chat that your audio is still pretty low. So if, oh, um, sorry. Okay. You can speak up next time. I, I did want to... Uh, when we talked earlier today, you mentioned that um, the Prime Minister was on 
Ray Hadley. And um, although there's a lot of uh, hope going around, as you said, and the movement that we've seen uh, start over the last few weeks shows no sign of abating. Um, we also had the, the Prime Minister on Ray Hadley kind of saying, men don't always get it right. And, uh, and what are your reflections on that and how, how our leaders are kind of responding to this moment? Oh gosh, obviously that was extremely disappointing. And um, I think I said on social media, it just reminded me of, the, it was very nineties, um, this kind of like men are from Mars, women are from Venus. We live on different planets. We can't possibly understand each other. And that's an excuse for getting it wrong. And that really is an impediment to us having this conversation, this kind of false belief that as, as different genders, we're somehow incapable of kind of understanding what, what we're talking about. I think as many people have said, this is a human issue. As a human being, I, I think that he's quite capable <laughs> of getting to grips with what we're on about, yeah. Indeed, indeed. All right, well, let's go to Dr. Zach next. And um, after we've introduced all our panelists, we'll have a bit more of an open conversation. But Dr. Zach Seidler is a clinical psychologist. He's the Director of Mental Health Training at Movember and a research fellow with Origin at the University of Melbourne. Zach's devoted several years to the goal of reducing the staggering male suicide rate, treating and researching men's mental health with over 30 peer reviewed articles published. Zach has worked clinically with men of different ages and presentations from adolescents in Darwin with early psychosis to older HIV positive men struggling with adjustment. Zach's appeared on the ABC, BBC, Sky News and in The Guardian, The Age and Vice, really anyone who will take him. He was on The Current Affair last week uh, and people love to chat to Zach. Uh, Zach, I want to ask you, it's been said a lot um, on my social media feed and in numerous uh, interviews that I've seen that while we all know a woman who has been harassed, if not abused by a man, not many of us know a man who admits to being a harasser or a violent abuser. So I'd love to hear your reflections as someone who spends a lot of time speaking with men about their attitudes, their opinions, their feelings and relationships. How do you think men are responding to this current public conversation. Is there any sense of men taking more responsibility out there at all? Huge question. Um, and thank you for having me. And it's great to be here. And I don't do just anything. This is this is a special event. Um, and it's great to be here with, with everyone, better than a current affair even, I would say. Um, and uh, I, I wanted to start by, by again, uh, as well as Christine saying so, um, say thank you to all of the the women in the audience and men who are, who are survivors um, and, and profess from the outset that I will potentially, um, you know, make some generalizations. That's not my intention. And um, I, I really respect your bravery um, and your courage. Uh, and, and hopefully this is the beginning of a huge shift in our society. Um, so you are right. My new Twitter handle is going to be man whisperer. That's, that's my day to day. Um, and, uh, I'm, I'm kind of disheartened, uh, really, with the, uh, the way that our leadership has been dealing with this um, whole tidal wave. And I would say that I'm, I'm kind of disheartened with the way that, that men have been dealing with it. Um, it's really nice to be doing this in front of an audience, uh, because Brad, Michael and I have had a couple of meals where you'd be very worried listening, listening in if, if you didn't know who we were. Uh, talking about suicide, child sexual abuse, domestic violence, but that's kind of the issue here because um, that's my first point around responsibility. What is going on right now has been rife in this country for, for generations and the world over really. Um, and it is fundamentally a men's issue. It is fundamentally a responsibility of us as men and the women who have the energy to continue the fight. Um, that means you know, that it shouldn't be so unusual to see three grown men sitting in a restaurant discussing their, their experiences about violence, their, their understanding of uh, you know, their own mental struggles and how they've had to overcome certain things. Uh, but it is very strange. Um, and I think that that says a lot about the moment that we're in, which is that uh, the silence is, is deafening. Uh, and you know, it took how long for Scott Morrison to come forward and make a uh, you know, a statement about this stuff that, that had any semblance of, of empathy in it. Um, probably not enough uh, for many women out there to start with. But, you know, 
it, it took him a while. And I would say that the responsibility uh, that has been on men's shoulders for a very long time and is now coming to the fore has really, um, you know, the way that men have, have led has been uh, lacking substance and timing and tone. <laughs> um, and, and that is something that needs to change. But if, if you're to think about men and masculinity in the current moment, our media and public discourse will really tell you that it's in crisis. It will tell you, you know, that it's toxic. And these blanket statements are, are isolating many men, to be honest with you. And that's, that's what I'm finding on the ground. And um, I understand uh, why it is isolating, um, but the, the fundamentals of masculinity are, are striving for self-betterment, uh, are pushing oneself, um, you know, to find a way to, to, to belong and look after others and provide and protect. Uh, what is happening right now is not masculinity. Um, it's depravity, really. And, um, you know, we need as men to pull up our sleeves and, and we need to be allies. And so what we need to do is us men who are leaders in the field, who work in this space, need to clearly articulate what men need to do, not what men shouldn't do. There's been so much discourse about all of the bad things that men are doing, which needs to happen, but we need an equal narrative here, which says all of the things that, that should be looked up to, that are authentic, genuine, and meaningful and useful as depictions of masculinity. Um, the vacuum that has been filled with Weinstein and Trump and you know shit guys really needs to needs to be filled with positive role models um, that uh, rewrite this narrative around what masculinity and manhood looks like. You know, we need to provide a doctrine, a mantra for how to be a man in this day and age. And working with teenage guys, I can tell you, they have no bloody idea what's going on. Um, they're scared and they are, they feel like everything is grey. When to us, hopefully as adults, consent and, and violence and sexual assault is, uh, is black and white. And um, we need to open a space to allow them to question this stuff to understand uh, that it's okay to ask before they're in crisis, before shit has hit the fan really. And, um, you know, take it upon themselves uh, to take that responsibility to go, all right, I am a part of this dialogue and I am also a part of this behavior. I'm a part of, uh, you know, whether it's a man or a woman that I'm in, you know, a, a relationship with, uh, I, I have responsibility for my own actions that it cannot just be placed on them to deal with the aftermath really. So responsibility uh, comes with, with dialogue and open conversation and the silence and stigma and shame has been going on for too long. Thanks Zach, it's um, yeah, interesting. We often have these conversations in, in relation to you know, racism or homophobia or, or other issues as well, where we say people just need to you know, learn to be better, learn to take responsibility, learn to not be not be racist, not to hate others. And I think the question where we need to explore tonight is how do we actually go on that on that journey? It's um, it's easy for us to sit in this room and say um, men have to take responsibility or men have to self reflect, men have to think about their actions. Um, the question is how how do we get there? So. Our next um, panelist to introduce is uh, Professor Michael Salter, who's a Scientia Fellow and a criminologist at the University of New South Wales. His research is focused on gendered violence and sexual exploitation, including primary prevention, complex trauma, and technology facilitated abuse. He's the author of two books, including the first study of child sex sexual exploitation in Australia, organized sexual abuse, and an examination of abuse and harassment on social media called Crime, Justice and Social Media, as well as over 40 papers on violence, abuse and trauma. He's on multiple boards that I'm reading here and has extensive experience in the prevention of child abuse, domestic violence and sexual assault, has worked with Women's Safety New South Wales and Vic Health on the primary prevention of violence against women and was appointed as an expert advisory on the primary prevention of child sexual abuse to the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse. He's also fresh off an appearance on Q&A last week, and so he's freshly famous, and we're really glad that you're with us tonight, Michael. And so following on a bit from uh, Christine and Zach's contribution, what is it with men? 
We know that something like 95% of all violent acts are perpetrated by men against people of all genders and against children. And as much as many of us wanna say not all men or somehow think it's other men and not this man, it's clear that gender plays a huge role. It's us. Um, and this isn't a man-hating statement, it's just the facts. So tell us, what is that all about? What's wrong with men? What is wrong with men? I mean, I, I really think this this moment, I, I feel really significant in Australian history. Um, I've just never seen a confluence of pressures at such a high level in relation to sexual violence in this country. And one of the things that it's brought to the fore, and it's just it's an in an extraordinary way, um, is complicity. Um, a group of men who have chosen over time to maintain the party and the government as a really a bastion of male power. They were given multiple options and opportunities to, to shift towards um, a more inclusive and diverse stance. And they chose not to take that on the basis of so-called merit, which inevitably just seemed to keep appointing the same type of person into, into parliament and into government. Um, and, and now as this culture of sexual violence at the highest level of government is exposed, we see these men who have become this, it's become so normalized, it's so accustomed and so used to looking the other way, um, profoundly wrong footed by, by this moment. Um, and so, you know, for me, it's just such a clear illustration of some of the issues that we're grappling with here. Um, including men's resistance to thinking about our role in these structures because, you know, the, the same facts of life that are just evident for every woman in this country when she steps out of her house, you know, the moment the sun goes down um, and the, the reluctance that women have in this country to, lead, to, to step outside on their own for fear of um, for fear of violence, the fear obviously many women have in their own homes for very um, well-known reasons, those facts of life um, are literally invisible, um, let's be clear, to the Prime Minister, to the Prime Minister. He does not know or understand. And, and the moment that he said, you know, blokes are going to get it wrong, what he's saying is, what the behind that statement is, blokes are going to get it wrong about rape. Rape is what blokes are going to get it wrong with, and you've kind of going to give us a couple of shots, but, uh, you know, we're allowed to like miss a couple of times before we figure it out. No, the Prime Minister is not allowed to get it wrong on rape. Okay, I'm just going to take a deep breath. Um, so I, I think this is, this is a really, really important moment. And I think what else, the other thing that it's foregrounded for me is that there are enough senior women, particularly in the media at this point, senior female journalists and editors who will not let this go. And I think 10 or 15 years ago, this could have been buried. I think this moment could have been buried. And so it tells us something about real power in terms of what, 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 what is necessary for real change. It means real power, real influence, not just access and opportunity, but, but having a society in which men have no choice but to be accountable. Um, and that's you know, an incredibly strong driver of sort of cultural change. Um, so I, I think you know, in terms of what is wrong <laughs> with men, I think we have, you know, we have cultural challenges around male entitlement. You know, that is absolutely true. I think we have structural challenges around the way in which that entitlement is instantiated into the fabric of society in ways that have to change. If they don't change, then Brittany, the, the, we will have more, uh, we will have more Brittany Higgins. Uh, we'll have, I mean, we already have innumerable Brittany Higgins and with, you know, with great respect to Brittany for coming forward and all of the survivors that have put this um, issue on the agenda. Uh, in terms of sort of the men's work here, I'm, I'm a longstanding sort of critic of symbolic gestures around this. I think there is work to do. And I think we see that work now in front of us in terms of the changing of structures. That is very practical work that we need to commit ourselves to um, and to implement and to operationalize. That's step-by-step -step work. It's not mysterious, it's not symbolic. It's, it's right there in front of us. I mean, I think for some of the men in the field and in the sector, I think there's more work to do about unpacking 
the experience of men and boys in the context of gender inequality and really starting to think about how we do engage men and boys through their experience. I think the emotional aspect of gender inequality for men and boys is poorly understood. Um, I really do affirm what Zach said that a lot of the conversation that we see that gets a lot of traction around men's violence on social media and it's a conversation about responsibility and accountability and so on, whether you like it or not, it just doesn't work to engage men and boys in the field. And we can keep repeating yes or men, no or men, some men, whatever you want to do. But in the end, if it's not actually getting young people, young men to listen to us, to take these issues on board, to work them into the fabric of their life, then we've got to look for the right strategies. And that means listening, <laughs> it's not rocket science, but listening to, to boys and men taking their perspective seriously, that doesn't mean accepting excuses for the status quo. So there is a fine line there. Yeah, thanks, Michael. I, I'd, Christine, I'd love to you to reflect on, on Zach and Michael, what, they, what they've said from the men's perspective. Have you got any, any thoughts about their reflections on, on men and uh, the role of men in, I guess, addressing the challenges that we have today? Yeah, I, I jotted down a few things. Um, well, firstly, this, in the 20 years that I have been, um, you know, an advocate and a journalist working in this space, um, this is the first time that I've been the only woman <laughs> on a panel about this issue. So that is, that's something. Um, and- Is that a good something or a- yeah, That's a good something. Interesting. Something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, the, the people who need to be having these conversations and more than words, but deeds and talking about what those deeds are, are having these conversations. So that's saying something to me, um, that, that's positive. Um, first time it's happened to me in 20 years. So um, I think uh, a, a couple of things that um, I think it was Zach who said, we need to clearly articulate what men should do and not what men shouldn't do. That really kind of resonated with me. Um, and also the, the, the point, just getting back to that point that Michael made about the, the tipping point in the media and there being um, women in the media who really won't let this go. Um, obviously you can hear from my accent that I'm originally from the US and mm. I've been in the UK for seven years. So I tend to sort of follow how these issues sort of play out in different contexts. And one, if you read um, She Said, which is Megan Twoey and um, you know, book about how Me Too came to pass in the US, What's really interesting is that there was a real structural shift within, can everybody hear me? Sorry, should I come a bit closer? To my a bit closer. It's, it's yeah. a bit louder than last time, but yeah. Yeah, I'll speak up a bit. So there was a real structural shift in newsrooms and in the media in the US. So the New York Times created a gender unit and they decided that they were gonna basically mainstream gender issues and not just as like women's issues as like fashion or lifestyle, but really mainstream it into their coverage. And then that gender team sat down and they said to themselves, what are the biggest issues in gender that we're not covering? And they said sexual harassment. And then they mm. said, what are the biggest issues in sexual harassment that we're not covering? And yes, Harvey Weinstein's name came up, but, um, and they did pursue that story, but they also did a series where they looked at um, sexual harassment of women in blue collar professions, including at the Ford Motor Factory. So that was a real structural shift within the media where the media was really saying, we're gonna give these issues a higher priority. We're gonna you know, pursue them relentlessly. And I think Michael's right. We have seen a tipping point of sort of senior women in the media. And I know that there's this meme or this mug that's going around at the moment that Laura Tingle, all hail the queen, yeah. uh, is not having it. Um, but she's not <laughs> the only one. There's lots who just aren't having it anymore. And I think that that's gonna, um, continue to be the case. When I, when I first started writing about these issues in the Australian context just three years ago, I'd say it was a very different story. And I was hearing from a lot of people in the press gallery, we, well, you know, Christina, we, we have a tradition of private lives being private here. Mm. And I think that there's a sort of cohort of women in the media now who have just called bullshit on that basically, and just will not let that status quo private life, like sexual harassment, sexual abuse is not a private lives matter. It's, it's, a, it's a harm, it's, it's an abuse of power and they will call it out. Yeah, 
Indeed. Um, we spoke, I guess, um, Zach and Michael both spoke about how we, you know, take men on a journey to get to a place where there is no sexual harassment, no sexual violence um, or violence in general. And I'm sure some of you on, on the webinar have seen the, the semi-famous memes going around that kind of flip the, the victim blaming tropes on their head and say 10, 10 ways to not rape and then say to men, you know, carry a, a whistle to blow if you might rape someone or, um, you know, not go out, uh, not go out alone um, if you're feeling rapey and, you know, quite simply um, to not rape. And, and it seems like a simple conclusion. How do we stop men being violent and um, sexually abusive? Well, men just stop doing that. Um, so simple, but how do we actually get there to that point where, um, where men make that choice and make it as the cultural norm rather than the exception? Um, I think that was a question for me, Brad, is that right? Yeah. Um, I'm glad you asked that question because I think that really brings together a number of threads that I've been thinking about quite deeply, particularly this past week. Um, so I think I would say in order to get there, we first need to recognize that there's not an obvious or simple solution. Um, I love those memes because they kind of really point out the hypocrisy of victim blaming and make you laugh and make you think about it. But um, if we're going to you know, address this issue more substantively, we kind of need to go beyond the simplicity and engage with the nuance and the complexity. Um, you know, I really recognize why there's a desire, particularly when you see the impact of human harm in, in, on, with these issues to, to grasp for a simple solution. And I think that's where uh, the police chief of New South Wales kind of got, Mick Fuller kind of got himself into trouble uh, this week, or was it last week? It's all bleeding into each other now um, with that app. It's, it's definitely tempting to go, oh yeah, okay, you know, simple solution, um, an app will fix this. Um, but we are really fortunate in Australia that we have quite a significant body of work. And I know that um, both, both Michael and Zach have contributed to that in, in the primary prevention space that has articulated, that has literally laid out the story of how we got here and where we need to go. And probably the biggest example of that is Change the Story, which is the national framework for primary prevention, which was um, created by Our Watch, the National Foundation uh, to Prevent Violence Against Women. And that really sets out the work that we need to do. And Michael talked about, or maybe it was Zach, about how we need to stop telling men what not to do and start really articulating to them very clearly what to do. And I think that there are a lot of really clear um, messages in that document and other primary prevention work, things like bystander action, where we're really articulating what to do, not just what not to do. And um, what, and we need to do that in different, you know, what the anoraks call settings. And just simply put, that's you know, every place that we live, work and play. Um, and I think we're really lucky in Australia that we have such an excellent body of work uh, to draw upon. And it does trouble me a little bit when you have new people who kind of come into this space, going back to the example of, of Mick Fuller, who then when their tendency to grasp for the simple solutions is called out, then they sort of retreat to this, well, I'm just trying to start a conversation. And in doing so, they're kind of revealing their ignorance of this significant body of work uh, that really lays out the nuance of, of the, the issues and the solutions. So I think in order to get there, um, wherever there is, and we're hoping that's a place where women and children are safe um, in their homes and in their workplaces and everywhere in this country, that um, they will first in, in humbly <laughs> engage in, in, that, in, those, in, that, in that body of work um, and listen to the people who it's like, you know, no mate, you're not starting a conversation. There's actually lots of us who have been having that conversation for a very long time. So enter the space humbly, um, listen and, and listen to this body of work that we have and engage with it and then start to think really deeply 
about what you individually can do and what you can collectively do in the communities that you live in, the, your workplaces, to start to act on some of those recommendations. Awesome, thanks, Christine. Um, Zach, I wanna ask you about your work in just a moment, but do you have any reflections on, on Christine's um, contribution just now, what she said? Sure, I, I agree wholeheartedly. And I think that uh, really what we need to consider is the fact that uh, the roadmap is unclear for many men. And, and as, as we've all discussed, providing that there, there exist plenty of documents that that are out there that are hidden on, on shelves uh, that need to come out, that need to be spoken to by the Prime Minister, uh, clarified uh, as, as the way forward. Uh, because for instance, we've, I've, I've been watching the, the chat here and, and I've seen uh, lots of people saying, what's the, uh, we've got three men on, on the panel, but I wonder what the, uh, the audience is, uh, gender split. I'm sure that it's around 80% female. Um, that's just how this rolls. And that is, uh, really problematic. I want to be clear, the men who are here, well done. That's, that's a great first step, yeah? I'm not going to take that away from you. And, and to put aside your time on a Thursday night is a great step. But uh, just as uh, putting a white ribbon on your lapel is not enough, nor growing a moustache as we do at Movember, uh, there is a lot more to be done beyond virtue signaling. And that means action. And that means taking it into your life and stepping beyond that that comfort zone, which you may have inhabited for a very long time, and being willing to be to be called out as as weak by uh, people who who sit within a, a hegemonic or traditional uh, norm, because they are the ones who are going to lose out uh, as this new world order of sorts comes comes into play. The nice guy is going to finish first. That is that is what we want uh, the new phrase to be, and I think that that that's coming. And I think that something that's really important is that uh, you can take your traditional masculine norms of being stoic and being strong and, and powerful, and you can use them to your advantage. You can use them in a way that is going to help others. Um, we don't need to throw the baby out with the bathwater. They exist and they are sometimes very useful. You know, a fireman can't just break down when he's in the middle of a fire. He needs to call on his resilience and push through or she. And so what we need to do now is realize what is the time and place for these, uh, these you know, ways of being in a, in a traditional masculine way. And let's use them to our advantage rather than to our detriment. And then we're gonna to get to the point where the kid in the playground who comes out and says, oh, I was supposed to lose my virginity on Saturday, but you know, she didn't want a bar of it. You know, it wasn't time. And instead of being you know, told that he's a pussy and, and, and that he should have you know, uh, just push, pushed on. In fact, we're gonna to get to the point where uh, he comes in, he's so powerful and he is so present in his ability to go, I was the good guy and this was the line and I didn't cross it. And if you come in without shame, then you're going to get to the point where others go, oh, look at that guy. He's pretty cool. And that's what, that's what we need. Awesome. I wanted to ask you, Zach, about um, men's mental health, which is where you spend a lot of your time and energy with Movember and personal practice. Um, on one level, and we, we hear this sometimes in the way the media reports situations and um, in conversation, at one level it seems like a cop-out to say that men are violent or sexually abusive due to their poor mental health. But I've heard you say in one of those uh, dinners that we have discussed earlier that mentally healthy men wouldn't use violence or coercion in their relationships. So talk to us about that for a minute. Is it our understanding of mental health that needs to change or is it that mental ill health exacerbates men's dependency on the validation we get from being in control and having power over others. Talk to us about that. I feel like it's a cop out, but I'm gonna say both because it's it's a complex situation and I I'll, I'll, won't be doing my due diligence if I don't explain that. So first and foremost, the mental health system we all know is broken. It needs to be shattered and started again. The, the Victorian uh, you know, uh, Royal Commission is making that clear and they're gonna do that hopefully and hopefully uh, you know, Prime Minister Morrison will listen uh, to, to what we've learned in Victoria and do things uh, differently throughout the country. What that means, though, from my perspective and my own work is that uh, the mental health system is failing men uh, fundamentally because it is not picking up on their distress. And it should not be on men to present distress that fits within a box. 
for it to be understood. Uh, and so we have what is considered at the moment an epidemic of, of male suicide, really, uh, that is happening because all of the warning signs are there in my eyes, uh, but to society, when you've got, you know, a diagnostic manual that, that says he should be crying, he shouldn't be able to get out of bed, all of these tick boxes, uh, we, don't, we don't see that. Instead, he's agitated, he's angry, he's irritable, he's potentially violent, he's misusing substances. Um, all of those symptoms are considered men behaving badly, but they are warning signs. And sadly, they are warning signs not only for suicide, but they are also warning signs for domestic violence and warning signs for, for future sexual assault. I, I consider this the unholy trinity of, of men's, men's behavior, the, the patriarchal triumvirate of sorts, which is, you know, that our overwhelming, uh, our collective consciousness is just is drowning in, in men's sexual assault, domestic violence and suicide. When you think of men and masculinity in our day and age, these three things are just rife. And we don't have a, a, a dual dialogue that is going on, as I said, uh, which is talking about healthy, positive, strong, useful uh, ma masculinity instead. Men harming themselves and men harming others are two sides of the same coin. Fundamentally, they are two sides and they are inextricably linked. And you know, I want, to, I want to call on Jess Hill's incredible book. I know that she's, she's in the audience and she speaks a lot about the fact that many of the, the men who, who are domestically violent um, have no history of, of mental ill health. Uh, and that should not be something that we call on as an excuse for many men's behavior, even if they do have these issues. It is men's responsibility to treat themselves for these issues, to seek help for these issues. If you have an outlet, if you've worked through your own personal issues, if you've spoken openly about them with dinners with your mates as we do, you don't take it out on others. You know, that's the fundamental truth. I've, I've witnessed people with serious trauma doing the hard yards to overcome it and, and they find healthy, resilient ways to cope. It's not easy, yeah? We, we can't suggest that it is. But I would not be a psychologist, I would be a failed psychologist if I did not believe in rehabilitation. And I did not believe uh, that there is a, a wave of distress that is going on that needs to be tapped into and heard uh, amongst our male population. Um, so I think that the system needs to be able to better catch these guys early, especially as teenagers, when they are doing, you know, reckless, dumb, risk-taking shit that, need, that, that we can see and we just go, oh, it's boys being boys. It's not. It's a cry for help. And it's something that we can pick up on much earlier. Um, I'm sick of being in therapy and having a, a mum or, or a wife rock up in, in place of the man and try to work out strategies to deal with his distress. It is not their responsibility. The men need to front up and deal with this stuff and nip it in the bud early. And that is what Movember is all about. It's about early intervention and prevention. And that's what all of us should be hoping for here, which is that when you see something small, we need to get onto it early. Um, Christine, how do you respond to, to that idea? I've seen mixed um, responses in the in the chat popping up. Um, some people saying still sounds like an excuse there, Zach. Others saying, yeah, you're right, right on the money. Um, what do you think, Christine? Um, I'm just thinking about, uh, you, you alluded to Jess's book and um, hi, Jess. <laughs> yeah, I think Jess had a lot of really powerful things to say about the role that um, masculinity and mental health plays in, in this, this whole mix when she talked about the concepts of humiliated fury and sh she talked about shame. And um, I think that that really resonated with me and it sounds like it, it resonated with you as well, Zach. Yeah. Yep, very much so. And I yeah. think we need to look at our kind of contemporary environment to see examples of that um, in, in, in full display and um, some of what we can kind of call the more toxically masculine um, behaviors that we've seen from some of our leaders, including, you know, the, I wrote a piece that um, the bunker boy incident of um, Donald Trump sending out the National Guard to essentially clear the square so he could march across and then um, photograph himself with the Bible was a real kind of lucid example of mm. theory in action um, because, you know, he was called Bunker Boy and then felt this need, 
was compelled to feel this need to sort of prove his uh, masculinity. When you watch that kind of now infamous exchange with Scott Morrison and um, Andrew from Sky News, uh, arguably that would kind of fit into this uh, category as well, because he was really kind of put on the spot saying, you lost control, haven't you? And it is about that. He, he got to the very heart of that issue. You, you, you should be in control. And then um, Scott Morrison reacted with that kind of unscripted and very uh, problematic response where he then outed a supposed experience or rumor he had heard about a sexual harassment claim at Sky. But that was very much kind of in response to his desire, his humiliated fury, his, his entitlement to control being publicly called out in, in the forum and that's that's how he responded. So we see so many examples of this in, in action. Um, but I, I think it's also very important to remember that it's never an excuse um, for violence and that it um, exacerbates the violence, it's a contributing factor. But what the evidence does show us is that at its heart, um, various manifestations of gender inequality are the key drivers. So we do really need to focus a lot of effort on, on those issues. Thanks, Christine. Um, Michael, we'll go to you. You might want to comment on, on uh, Zach and Christine's uh, comments just there, but I but also wanted to throw into the mix something that is often, um, we can use the word excuse again sometimes. Uh, you spoke on Q&A about the influence of pornography on young men and women's expectations around sex and the prevalence of dominance and control and violence in what is often in popular pornography and it becomes you know kind of expected or normalized sexual activity for young people and so i'm interested in your thoughts on how significant that is to the experience of women over recent decades especially considering that um you know, sexual abuse, sexual violence isn't new. That's been going on forever. Um, and the, but the prevalence of this kind of pornography is relatively new. Um, and although that's new, the phenomenon of violence isn't new, if that makes sense. So what is the actual role of pornography? Is it another way of pushing away our responsibility to be decent, respectful men? Yeah, great. I, I mean, to, to, to touch on the issues raised by um, Christine and Zach, uh, you know, a, a real, for me and my thinking around these issues, um, you know, some years ago, it sort of struck me and I just thought, you know, like no five-year-old boy, if you ask a five-year-old, if you, if you caught a domestic violence offender at 30 and you asked him at five years of age, okay, this is my hypothesis, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? He was never, he, no five-year-old boy is going to say, oh, I want to, you know, I want to beat the people that I care about the most. I want... I want my kids to be afraid of me. You know, I want my relationships to fall apart because I can't, um, because of my violence and aggression. That, that's nothing that anyone is born with. It's nothing that they aspire to. And, and I think it's important to acknowledge that where perpetrators are using violence and abuse, something has gone wrong for them. Something's gone wrong for them. Whatever we want to label it or whatever we want to call it, something's gone wrong for them. And we talk about gender inequality, sure, but how does it get its hooks into boys and men? I mean, this is the crucial question. We can point at all of the social and the economic and the legal facts about gender inequality, but ultimately it takes up purchase in the minds and hearts of boys and men. How does it get in there? How, and, and what keeps it there? What makes it so appealing? And so it's why I am really interested in some of the psychological perspectives that Zach is putting forward. I do not think that looking at men's mental health or looking at men's alcohol and drug abuse, which is appalling and extremely prevalent, I don't think that looking at men's emotional problems is in some way distinct from a conversation about gender inequality. This is what gender inequality is. This is the substance of it in the lives of boys and men. So. I think often we sort of play off this binary where there's sort of the social fact of gender inequality. And if we acknowledge that, then we can't talk about the more individual lived experience of it. Um, we often, you know, you often hear this conversation, oh, that's an excuse. It's just how, it's, it's literally what gender inequality, it's part of what it's made up out of. 
Um, and I am really worried about this tendency to sideline that because I think that's how it gets its hooks into boys and men, basically. Um, so the, the, the porn question is a really important one. It's a really vexed one. You know, there is a kind of a narrative out there um, that's pretty common, which is basically that porn is driving sexual violence or it's creating sexual violence. And we do need to kind of put that to bed because what we know is that rates of sexual violence um, in terms of the prevalence of sexual violence, we don't have evidence that it's increased over the last 20 years. It's extremely high. <laughs> Just to be clear, we're talking about an epidemic here and we see fluctuations in prevalence. We don't have evidence that porn, that, sorry, that, that sexual assault has increased um, simultaneously with the accessibility of, of pornography. What has increased is the willingness of both women and kids to report sexual assault to police. That's been very consistently going up. Um, but in terms of prevalence, no. We also know that countries that have no porn in them or extremely restricted access to porn, some of them have quite high rates of sexual violence because they are patriarchal authoritarian regimes that don't have a free press, so they don't have access to porn. And then countries that have relatively liberal access to porn um, are also liberal democracies that have statutory protections and commitments to gender equality. So, so just to sort of, sort of put that to bed for a moment, because the, I think it becomes an easy scapegoat. Um, I think there are a lot of red herrings in this debate that are relevant, but if we focus on them too much, we do abrogate ourselves of responsibility for social change. And I think that's one of the risks of, of porn. Um, there's, there is about 70 years of research into what we call media effects. So since the 1950s, people have been worried about the impact of violent and explicit media in TV, film, comic books, VHS, um, computer games, video games, and now porn. And 70 years of research shows that we're not facing a kind of a monkey see, monkey do problem where kids and young people just do what they see. We're, we've got seven years of research suggesting that what the media does in terms of violent and explicit content is it sets an agenda and it frames issues for, um, for children and for young people. And I think that's where the concern for, 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 for porn comes in. One of the things that porn does, and we know this is what it does, is it expands sexual repertoire. So it obviously exposes young people to a variety of sexual acts without context um, and, and, you know, and decontextualized in a range of different ways. Now, uh, there might be some trends there that we might think are, I don't know, beneficial. So for example, mutual oral sex in heterosexual relations is now much more common than it was 30 years ago. That's probably partly or wholly because of the normalization of oral sex in porn. Okay, so that's that's one way in which porn's potentially expanded sexual repertoire for young people and and um, for, and and adults in heterosexual relations. There are other aspects of porn influenced sexual practice that women are consistently flagging is a problem that they are being asked to perform or, or in some cases coerced or forced to perform acts that a male partner has seen in the context of pornography. Now, one of the things that violent explicit media does, particularly for boys and men who have pre-existing risks around aggression and violence, is it does affirm those impulses and it does amplify those impulses. And I think that's, I think that's where we're seeing some of the acute harms of, of porn. Um, is boys and young men with, uh, with a repertoire of sexual practice that's become quite harmful. But I think more broadly what we've seen is in a culture where sexual coercion is already quite normalised, um, we've got boys and young men who are kind of armed with this sexual repertoire um, that is making girls and women, and we see this very consistently in research, yes, we're, we're also hearing it just in our interpersonal lives, but we see it clearly in research, girls and women saying, I'm being asked or coerced or harassed into acts that I wouldn't choose if, if I felt like I could say no, basically. Thanks, Michael. I wanna um, start moving us towards the, the solutions in a way, um, but reflecting on what we've all discussed so far and, and Christine has brought us back to this a few times, all, all the evidence suggests that gender inequality, um, as we've discussed with the Change the Story um, platform, um, Change the Story resource from our watch and other conversations, gender inequality is at the core of all this. Men's expecta expectations that they're 
desires, ambitions, opinions will be privileged over that of women. So I guess, um, Christine, I'd love you to reflect on what we've discussed about mental health and, and pornography and other factors like alcohol and drugs. Um, but really to come to some kind of um, way forward, what are the solutions then? Um, I just want to reflect that I think Michael's point about um, men's mental come health. Come forward a little bit if you Men's can mental health being sort of inextricably linked to this and the way that he articulated it is, is a really powerful point. It is the lived experience of how the sort of patriarchy manifests itself gets its hooks into men and that's that's the result of it and also you know we have much higher suicide rates amongst men lower rates of help seeking so th it is the way that these gender stereotypes this gender inequality gets its hooks into men manifests itself and causes human harm for men so that is the way that it's inextricably linked and it's really important to reflect on that um, i think that's very important at, at a, you know, reflecting back on the kind of primary prevention frameworks and the, the solutions and thinking about uh, where that framework and those understandings kind of point us. They talk about some of the drivers of um, the gender inequality question, specifically being um, condoning of violence against women, men's control of decision-making and limits on women's independence, stereotyped constructions of masculinity, uh, disrespect towards women and male peer relations that um, emphasize aggression. And so in terms of the solutions, it, it points us towards a number of things, including challenging the condoning of violence against women, which is a society-wide tendency. And that um, brings us to things like active bystander programs and leadership in that regard. So it's really disappointing to see um, on two occasions this week, our prime minister, whilst saying he's listening to women, still in a sort of, well, we first we had our um, home affairs minister, Peter Dutton, referring to the he said, she said kind of classic um, language. And then on each occasion, it seems like Scott Morrison only read the she said portion of that story. <laughs> Um, when asked about this. So, you know, Christian Porter says he didn't do it. Fine, um, fair enough. And Eric Abbott says he didn't say that about Brittany Higgins. Fine, fair enough. And is that really being an active bystander? Are you modeling to the rest of society that um, you are reflecting on how we as a society condone um, violence against women or are you contributing to the problem? So I would put that question to our prime minister. Um, promoting women into decision-making roles. So we've had a conversation this week about um, quotas for women in the Liberal Party. And people might ask, well, what does that have to do with you know, the situation to hand and what we're talking about? Well, obviously having um, more women in senior positions of leadership changes the context in which these things are discussed and it changes the conversation. And we know that. Um, challenging gender stereotypes. So maybe, for example, uh, just to throw out a crazy idea, 10 years after we have introduced parental leave here in Australia, we could revisit the um, parental leave arrangements. Australia has some of the most unequal parental leave arrangements in favor of women um, that excludes men from being the kinds of active parents that they want to be of any country in the OECD. It's just absolutely ridiculous. Um, and that's a structural situation that really says that it that embeds those gender stereotypes that says women are the carers and men are the what do they call them secondary carers um so that's something that we could look at and um that would help change the context um the air that we breathe uh the way that this sort of gets its hooks into us and seeps into our 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 world um and also strengthening positive, respectful relationships and respectful relationships education. And I think we really need to, this unfortunately sounds a bit controversial, um, but take that issue out of the culture wars in this country. Yeah. It is really unfathomable to me that when we start to talk about things like respectful relationships education and the kind of conversations that we need to be having with young people, including about porn, 
um, that it ends up becoming, getting put in that kind of culture war basket and then people are afraid to touch it or to fund it and then we're not having the conversations that we really need to be having. Yeah, thank you, Christine. Um, I think the challenge again with, with all of this and I'm gonna throw to Zach um, now, we, we have these conversations with men and women who are on board with the with the agenda like we're we're mostly here tonight because we want to see change we if we're blokes that benefit from these systems um we want to change them that's why we're here tonight um the question is i think uh, as we all work towards gender equality respectful relationships um uh, you know treating each other with decency and respect how do we engage men and boys in a way that leads to real change for the future. Have you got any ideas for us, Zach? How do we get those ones that are not in this uh, webinar with us tonight? Sure, that, well, that's the, the million dollar question. And yeah. that's, that's something that all of us need to really reckon with. I love preaching to the choir. I will continue to come to these because it's fun and I like Twitter and everyone's nice to me and it's great. But when it comes down to it, uh, the, the, the boy that I saw this afternoon who doesn't want a bar of me is, the, the, the person that I should be putting all of my energy into. And so um, what we need to do is, and again, I'll, I'll call on my Bemba because I think that's something they've done incredibly well is they've somehow pulled one and a half million guys to talk about their health. That is just not done. It has never been done before. I haven't seen it done since. And so uh, the way that they've done that, that is, is by going to where men are um, they go to workplaces and sporting communities. Um, they go into male-dominated spaces. Um, they go with male role models and they speak in a way that, that makes sense to men. And I think that's something that's important here and is very difficult for me as a PC woke policeman uh, is that I have to sometimes uh, hang that on, on the coat rack and find a way to connect a message uh, that comes with irreverence and humour and can sometimes be considered... Uh, you know, mildly problematic, I would say, but I get them through the door. And that is essential if we're going to begin this conversation. We all hope that traditional masculinity is going to be broken down and we're going to get rid of stereotypes and there won't be the binary. And we, we all hope for that. We're all working towards that, everyone in this audience, I'm sure. The problem is, is that that's not where we are. That's not the reality. And every time I go out for breakfast with, with Michael, we sit there and we're like, people just need to come to terms with the reality of the situation, which is that uh, things are somewhat broken and you can't just eradicate it and, and start from scratch because that's not how society works. So what we need to do is, is embrace the reality. We, we can hope for a new leadership where, you know, I don't know if any of you have heard the Barack Obama and Bruce Spring Springsteen um, uh, podcast that's going on at the moment. How beautiful, how good would it be to have ScoMo here right now talking to us, uh, you know, even sitting around with a group of men and just going, let's have a discussion about this and, and modeling that. And what's really important, uh, I saw someone in the chat said, what should I say to my five-year-old boy? Model to your boys, don't talk, do. They are watching you. It is not about what you say because, you know, the next moment uh, you're going and you're, and you're shaking your wife or you're screaming or you're doing something, you know, that is untoward and is completely different and they forget what you say. So be really clear and, and, and rely on their strengths. Focus on things that they do well and try to build those up. Uh, that's the fundamentals of, of, you know, parenting coaching is to go pay attention to the things that kids are doing well. And we need to do that with men full stop. We need to, to embrace those voices um, and give them, uh, you know, more prominence because the, when you think about the NRL, for instance, we've got all of these players who are working for Movember and all of these different organisations. They come out, they do awesome stuff. They talk to all of the junior teams. And then we've got Jared Hain and he is everywhere now and he is all over the media and he is guilty and that's what they see. And, and that is what the, the, the now, the, the manifestation of masculinity in this current moment is Jared Hayne as a guilty sex offender. And so what we need to do is, is find a way uh, to get rid of those, those men out of positions of power, bring in good role models um, and more women, obviously, um, to, to just dampen that, that, that whole uh, you know, problem full stop and speak to men on their level. And, and, and that's really what's, what's very important here is to leverage that desire for self-betterment, um, 
be funny, try find ways to get them in the door and then offer them that, that key that they can take away with them once they trust you because trust and shame go hand in hand. And, and we've got all of this, this fear of, of trusting others and of talking about this stuff. But if we can provide a, a space for men with other men uh, to really discuss these topics openly, uh, we're gonna move forward much faster than in this uh, you know, dichotomized binary that we're sitting in at the moment. Yeah, thanks, Zach. You touched on um, children a lot there, especially seeing, seeing role models and growing up in a society where there's um, you know, better expressions of masculinity in, in the media and also in, in their lives. Um, and we've seen a lot in the last few weeks, uh, especially around some revelations around private schools and, and girls' experiences. We've seen a lot of conversation about schools being the solution. And um, actually at White Ribbon, we are constantly told you just need to get into schools and the younger the children, the better and, um, and et cetera. And of course, everyone um, wants you know, schools to teach consent and schools to teach respectful relationships. Um, but Michael, I'm gonna to throw to you, how, how significant do you think that is in terms of the broader solution? And, and especially I'm thinking about consent education, surely men already have a sense that non-consensual sexual activity or rape is not okay, and yet they do it anyway. Is, is articulating that better at school the solution as part of a broader respectful relationships conversation? Yeah, so I mean, I think it's a little bit like the um, the issue with porn, which is this is this is part of the mix, it's part of the equation, but the issue becomes the myopic focus on it. Um, and you know, when I was um, when I was on Q and A last. Thursday and um, Bryony Scott was on the panel with me, who's um, the principal of um, Winona Girls School. It's a private girls school up here in Sydney. And, you know, she, we were having a conversation backstage and she just said to me, you know, the, the, the onus is not on children to enact social change. And, and, I, and it really encapsulated something that has been sort of bugging me a little bit over the last month with this discussion about consent education. And I, I understand where it comes from and understand the impulse, but I also think part of it is to deflect responsibility from adults who don't know what to do. And I think we have to be honest here, when, when we're facing this epidemic of sexual violence, when we're hearing from thousands of young women who are now recounting sexual assault in their early teens, again, another generation, again, facing exactly what their mothers faced, what their grandmothers faced, that, that, you know, I think we have to be open and honest and say that I think for, it's just sometimes we don't know what to do. And that consent education kind of looks like this shiny new thing that we can say it's that. But, but putting all of the onus on it, essentially what we're saying is, oh, well, 13 year old boys are going to solve this problem. 13 year old boys need to change. No, at, we are the adults in the room. And this is what Bryony said to me. So that's what I'm going to say to you. We, <laughs> we are the adults. We make the decisions, actually. And the responsibility is ours. So, you know, yes, of course, we need consent. We need, we need sex education in schools for a range of reasons. You know, not only in order to give kids the foundation they need for good relationships, but also to protect them from sexual assault so that they've got an understanding of what can be done to their bodies. So I think, I, I think that's important, but I think consistently we have to challenge our own impulse to take the responsibility and to put it somewhere else, basically. I think there are some really interesting opportunities here, intervention points here for us as adults. I think one of them is fatherhood and particularly a man's first child. This is a point where I think a lot of men, regardless of what's been going on in their life, it's, it's, a, it's a point of um, flux for a lot of men where a lot of things are up in the air. Um, often their own shitty childhood start coming up, you know, their own bad, they, you know, their dads weren't great. They don't know how to parent. They feel entitled to their wife. All of a sudden they're not getting sex three times a week. You know, we know that um, all of a sudden the child or the pregnancy is taking all the attention of the partner. And we have these guys who get jealous of the baby. We know that this is a time where a lot of things come up for, 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 for men. We know it's a, a key risk area for the initiation of DV if DV hasn't been taking place in that relationship. But what if first fatherhood's an opportunity? What if it's actually a chance to get in there with a the guy and actually say, you know, this is how we do it. 
You know, this is what fatherhood looks like. This is how you can be a good dad. And there's actually research going back decades that shows that when men are supported in their parenting in early infancy, so they take responsibility in early infant care. So, you know, changing nappies, feeding, nighttime, all of that stuff, when they're supported to actually take, be proud of doing that work, not only might it reduce domestic violence, but in my area of work, it, it's also been shown to reduce child sexual abuse. Um, simply having a man who is involved in infant care is really, really healthy for that family. And I suspect really reparative for a man who might have quite poor role models. Maybe he becomes the dad he never was. So I think there's a real opportunity there. And I'd like to see more constructive discussion about engaging men at first fatherhood. I think the other point, you know, I sort of found this conversation about teenage boys over the last month quite kind of triggering. I mean, I don't know if anyone else remembers their early teens but it's awful when you're a boy. It's really bad. It's a really hostile environment. I mean, a lot of teen male peer cultures are really hostile, really violent. The number of physical assaults that teenage boys endure and perpetrate on a weekly basis is astonishing and it's completely normalized. And misogyny becomes a, an amazing defense mechanism because it protects you from any suspicion or any hostility. Um, it gives you like a ready-made brotherhood with your other misogynist friends. And then you've all got this kind of shared enemy or shared opposite in girls and women who you see and treat like complete aliens or objects. But the thing is, is that misogyny functions. It works in that early teen, early to mid-teen kind of peer environment. And that is what we throw as adults, teenage boys into. And we don't take responsibility for the cultures that form in that context. So I think there's real work to do in those early years of high school. Sorry to put it back onto schools because they, at the moment they have to do everything. But how do we disrupt those peer cultures? I think that's driving a huge amount of sexual violence in my view. Um, and I think it is incubating violence against women into the future. Yeah, thank you, Michael. There's a lot of um, great responses to you in, in the chat there. And I think that's really great insight. Um, we need to start wrapping this up. We've technically got about 15 minutes to go. And what I'd love um, from each of you, but first from Christine, is to, I guess, think about answering this question as if you're talking to the men um, on the webinar. Um, after all the things we've heard and discussed today, what do you want us to do? What do you want the men on this webinar to do? What is one thing we can go away from um, this webinar, taking all of the wisdom from the three of you and turn that into action. Um, probably two things. I think I am likewise absolutely fed up with symbolic action over real action. So about a year ago when Hannah Park was so horrifically and her children was so horrifically murdered, I put on social media a picture of a courier mail front page of various um, community leaders standing with their arms crossed saying no more. And I um, put on a courier mail front page from three years ago when there had been another horrific public, very violent um, murder of a woman by her partner where community leaders did the same thing. And here we were three years later with that symbolic gesture of everyone saying no more and in the exact same place. So I'm heartened by conversations like this where we talk about deeds not words um, action and not symbols and that is the place that we we need to move towards i'm also heartened because i think men do listen to other men more than they listen to me or other women um, experts in this space and i i wouldn't um Dane to sort of speak about kind of your experience and your experience of, of masculinity and, and how that impacts on you. So I think it's, um, but it's also important to engage with uh, the, the wealth of, it's great that there's a lot of new people as a result of the last five weeks in particular who are coming into this space, wanting to see solutions, wanting to see action, discern, discernible things happen on the ground to change this around. And I just would caution, I think like Michael, um, that when we talk about solutions, we are talking about solutions in the plural and that there's not gonna be a simple solution. It's a complex problem. And we're gonna really have to think deeply about this um, 
and we've had we're working on our fifth national action plan to reduce violence against women if, if four previous action plans and significant amounts of funding haven't um, quite cracked the issue contribute to the conversation as to why um, and where is it that we need to go now awesome Thank you, Christine. Zach, tell us, men, what do we need to do now to be a part of the change? Well, you know, Brad, but, I, but to everyone else, um, I, I, I think that uh, I'm so, I think the difference uh, between myself, you know, I feel this, I feel this rage and I feel this anger in, in a very uh, different way, I guess, to the way that the women do. And I also feel such boredom with the way that men are responding here. It's so boring. I'm tired of it. There has to be something new. And surely guys have it within them to just do something differently because it's just not working. And that is like the fundamentals of good leadership, of good fatherhood, of, of you know, being a good employee are, are shifting things. You know, we always say that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over, even though you're getting the same. That's what's happening here. And so, um, I think that we need to uh, provide a shift away from, um, as I said, the silence and the stigma towards action uh, and what we call action empathy, which is acting to empathize with the women in your life. Um, and that's something that is, that is fundamentally masculine, is something that we can all do, and, and is something that uh, men can rally around one another as well. And as Christine says, if we have those men in power who are role modeling this and, and propping other men up for, for not purely coming to a march, but for actually enacting change in their, in their workplaces at home, uh, we're going to be able to, to shift the dial here because you know something that we always say in the mental health space is, is guys pick up your phone and just call a mate and check in on them. Okay, so we're, we're trying to move towards health promotion there and really push guys to, to embrace that. What needs to happen is that we need guys to pick up the phone, call their mate and say, I want to talk about this topic and work out what we're going to do. I want to see on Saturday at the pub, groups of men sitting around talking about how they're going to do things differently. That'd be just the best. And I think that there are ways of going about that. And it's, and it's the key here is to separate themselves uh, from seeing themselves as the perpetrator, which I think is what happens very often here. We're, we're getting a lot of men who are, who are shit scared because they're seeing themselves as the perpetrator and they're not empathizing with the victim. And that's what's happening. And uh, what we need to do is go, if you are a man who, who has morals and ethics and who has not done any of this stuff, you need to find a way uh, to sit in the shoes of, of the victim and to find ways to actually enact change accordingly. Uh, because, you know, we say that patriarchy is, is an emotional defence and it, it means that we have to wrangle with those emotions and sit with the discomfort. And so when I'm sitting with my mates at the pub and they're all getting, you know, biting their nails and don't know how to talk about this stuff until a game comes on and then suddenly they're all verbose, we have to find the language and it doesn't matter what the language is at the moment, as I said, there just has to be the space for these guys uh, to be able to connect with one another about this, this stuff and overcome that, that discomfort with something that is foreign. It is foreign to many men. We're not taught how to do it and we need more people to promote how it looks uh, to, to get it done. Fantastic. Michael, one thing every man on this call should do next. Okay, uh, there is so much work to do. There's <laughs> so much work to do. We need accessible childcare. I mean, we're not uh, we're not going to get gender equality without accessible childcare. Frankly, Preach. like there there is a million things to do, and you know, and the thing about building systems is we don't. <laughs> the thing about building systems is it takes it. it does, we're not waiting for men to change to give women approval to be safe and well and free from violence. When you when you do the work to build the system, it doesn't matter whether the men approve of it or not. Like the cultural change is just getting them used to the fact that change has happened. Like that's the kind of cultural change that I want to see. So if you're a man and you want to get involved in this work, 
get in there. Like we need, we need affordable childcare. We need a mental health system that works. We need a family support system that gets in early and intervenes early and doesn't wait until a family's in crisis and then removes kids, including Aboriginal kids. There is a million things to do if you're a guy and you want to make this world a better place for women and kids and for men. And you know what? It's rewarding work. I love doing this work. It is great work. So do it. <laughs> That's my message. Let's add to that we need a uh, gender statement on every policy and piece of legislation. We need universal paid family violence leave mandated in every workplace. Uh, we need the 55 recommendations of the Human Rights Commission's um, respected work implemented and men can raise their voice on all of these issues while also at the same time working on uh, how we carry our power and privilege in our personal relationships. So yes, we can sort our own crap out and we can still advocate for systemic change, as you said, Michael. So some excellent things to do there. Um, I just wanted to say, as we draw to a close, that White Ribbon Australia in this new chapter is really committed to not simply being aware or raising awareness around sexual harassment and violence, but to engage uh, personally and proactively men and anyone who wants to get involved in working in their community to create change. We have a new program called Community Partners, which is a departure from the ambassador program. It's for people of any gender who want to reflect on themselves and their role in upholding or undermining, hopefully, the culture that creates the space for sexual harassment and violence to thrive. And then we have a program called Community Action Groups, which is where we gather like-minded people in different communities, however you understand community, geographic, faith, multicultural, sporting, occupation, um, to come up with community-led, um, unique responses to prevent men's violence and abuse, understanding that while men's violence is not unique to any community, the solutions probably are. And so we'd love you to get involved in those programs. Um, to finish up, I wanted to say that any, if anything you've heard tonight has been confronting or difficult or you've experienced violence or abuse and want to talk to someone about that, please call 1800RESPECT. And if you're a man who's realised that you are unsafe to be around at times and you don't want to use violence or controlling, controlling coercion in your relationships, please call Men's Referral Service for support and advice. Um, you know, one thing that we can all do is listen to the women in our lives, really listen, pause, um, put away our ego, ask real questions about how they experience life in this, um, in this world that we've seen unfold in public over the last few months, uh, and to reflect on our own role in um, you know, maintaining, or hopefully, as I said, undermining those cultures. We can listen, we can learn, we can have humility, we can reflect, we can change, then we can act and advocate. Seems like a lot of steps, but all of them um, just take a little change of mindset and a little action, a little proactive action. So thank you so much, Christine, Zach and Michael. Round of applause from all of us um, on the webinar today. I also wanted to thank all of you in the chat. Um, I've seen some people share some really vulnerable and authentic things in there with a group of strangers across the country. So I want to thank you for your authenticity and your willingness um, to do that and be that vulnerable with us. Um, thanks to Hannah and AFSA from Essential for the tech support and the team from White Ribbon Australia. It's not enough that we know what's going on is horrendous. We all know that. It's not enough to hope that someone else does something about it. It's going to require all of us to get to work to create a future free from all forms of men's violence and abuse. So I hope that you join us in doing that. Thanks for being with us, everyone and have a fantastic night.